I did something amazing last night. I took my girlfriend up to a fast food restaurant, and then later in that same night, I drove up to my parents' house to get a piece of mail that I needed, and then I stopped at a gas station to get some late night snacks for my friends and I, and I even talked to the clerk at the gas station about a JoJo's tabletop campaign that I've been planning with everybody since I overheard him talking to another customer about anime. I came home to resounding congratulations from everybody in my life, and I went to bed with this immense sense of pride and just a fire in my belly that I carried up to the moment that I wrote these words. By the end of this video, I think you'll understand why this was such an amazing accomplishment for me. Here's your content warning, though. If you get empathetically nauseous from hearing people describe their experiences with drugs or roller coasters or anything like that, you might want to skip to this time code. I'm about to describe the worst thing that's ever happened to me. The moment that's had a bigger influence on my life than anything I've experienced in my 26 years. Bigger than transitioning, bigger than finding love or a new family, bigger than anything. While I'm speaking candidly, I'd also just like to say that no, this is not the video that's going to be cutting into me deeper than anything I've ever made before that I teased in the last video. You'll know when that one starts. So about eight years ago, I was playing Grand Theft Auto 4, and suddenly I felt a little bit nauseous, and I was just sweating like a pig. I went outside to breathe in some of that cold winter air, and I decided to head to bed early that night. Of course, I needed a shower first on account of all the sweating. As the water in the shower warmed up and the bathroom started filling with steam, I collapsed to the floor. I hadn't passed out, but I was just extremely dizzy. My vision was spinning in a way that, ironically, I can only visually compare with the GTA 4 drunk camera. I'll shrink it down here so that you don't have to get sick too. It was comparable to the way that your vision spins when you're just blackout drunk and you're right about to cross the threshold into not remembering anything else that happens for the night. That's a rough situation, but when you're that drunk, it's pretty easy to just shrug it off. I wasn't so fortunate. I was completely sober, not even any weed in my system. I reached over the tub to turn off the shower so that the steam would stop, stripped off what remained of my clothes, and lied there desperately pressing every possible inch of my bare skin against the cold tiles of the bathroom floor for what felt like an hour, only ever moving to crawl to the toilet to throw up or to throw a towel over my back for a minute or two. As hot as I felt, I was freezing cold. The rest of the time, I was just laying there, staring at the dirty and hard-to-clean bolts which secured the toilet to the floor, trying my absolute best to keep my gaze locked on one particular piece of grime, as some sort of way to mitigate the ratchet cranking of my vision. I would try closing my eyes every now and then, but every time I did, it felt even worse, like I could feel my body being dragged around the floor even as I was perfectly still. After what felt like hours lying perfectly stationary on that floor, but couldn't have realistically been more than one hour, I heard footsteps around the house. Somebody was awake. While I could have called my family at any point, I was convinced that it would pass sooner rather than later. Besides, none of them are particularly good at noticing their phones ringing in the first place. So in spite of my pride, I moaned out to what I recognized to be my father's footsteps for help. He helped me walk, wrapped up in my towel, to the Murphy bed that was just outside the bathroom back then. He brought me a ginger ale, a bit of steak, and a banana, and a five-gallon bucket to throw up in. Unfortunately, one sip of the ginger ale, one bite of the banana, one whiff of the steak was all it took for me to throw it all up. Upon further examination, we found out that I couldn't even keep down saltine crackers, or plain rice cakes, or even water. Whatever was wrong with me, I would just have to wait for my body to get over it. Food and drink were not going to help me here. So there I was, again, lying stationary, freezing my ass off, only this time sweating through the sheets. I was once again doing my absolute best to not move an inch, or close my eyes, or let my pupils wander more than a degree or two in any direction. Now that I had a cushiony pillow and a mattress under my head rather than the unyielding bathroom floor, I noticed that every movement I made anywhere in my body would reverberate through the bedding and I'd feel it in my head triggering more vomiting. Just wiggling my toes made me sick at this point. After about three hours of this, I finally got what I wanted and I fell asleep. 
Upon waking up in the middle of the night, I noticed that my vomit bucket had been emptied and my dad had left toast, another banana, more water and ginger ale, saltine crackers, rice cakes, everything that you'd give to a drunk friend to help mitigate tomorrow's hangover on the floor where I could reach it. I also noticed that I didn't feel any better. I was still spinning just as badly as I had been. My stomach still couldn't parse a single drop of food or drink. Nothing had changed. I didn't even have a phone charger nearby, so music or YouTube was out of the question. Nobody else was awake anymore either, so it was just me and my spinning until I could manage to pass out again. I stayed focused on my single stationary points in space and laid there whimpering, hoping it would end or I'd fall asleep. Over the next three days, that was my life. No food or drink, just the occasional sips of water or V8 from a straw so I wouldn't have to move my head too much. The V8 was a complete failure. I went about three days without digesting anything, but thankfully I was able to keep most of the water down after a bit. I have never in my entire life been more convinced that I was going to die and I've never been more ready for it to happen than I was by the third day, when it dawned on me that what I was feeling then may very well be forever. Luckily, it wasn't. By the end of day four, I was comfortable swallowing food. The spinning had mostly stopped, and I was even able to walk around a little bit. Closing my eyes for longer than a blink was still out of the picture, but I could work with this. It was a good thing, too, because I had a court date just a couple days after that. The court date went fine, I only threw up once on the drive over, and after a week or two, I was pretty much back to my old self. (sighs) Thank God that that was just an isolated incident. It was easily the worst three and a half days of my life. Then it happened again, and again, and again, and again. Sometimes it would happen while I was driving and I'd just have to pull over and get a ride from somebody. Other times it would happen while I was in the grocery store and I'd just have to abandon my shopping cart and hobble to the car as quickly as I could so that I could strip down and lay in the back seat with the AC on in the parking lot. One time it happened at 3 a.m., about three hours from my family in one direction and three hours from my home in the other direction, with nobody but my sister drunk and sleeping in the back seat in a state where her license was suspended. I wound up laying on a field on the side of the road for a little bit until she sobered up enough that she could get us across state lines so she could drive us home slightly more legally. It even happened once when I was on a date with this cute girl. Kind of ruined the mood. Luckily, none of these vertigo attacks, as my family had taken to calling them, lasted as long as that first one, but each time it happened, it would take about two weeks or so for me to feel like I was more or less back to my old self again. Luckily, I was employed by my dad at the time, and I was living at home, or else I definitely would have lost my job and probably been made homeless by the whole situation. This wasn't really a point in my life where I had a ton of friends that I could have couch surfed with. Of course, we went to tons of different doctors, neurologists, ear, nose, and throat doctors, GPs, all totally affordable back in those days, but none of them had any idea what was wrong with me. We tried all sorts of home remedies, exercises, special smoothies and supplements and teas, but none of them made a dent in my symptoms. For a time, I was taking so much Dramamine every day that the sweet old lady at my nearest gas station always ordered, like, about five times what a normal convenience store would stock, just for me. Eventually, though, the Dramamine stopped working too, just as all the other things did. I was, by all affordable accounts, a medical mystery. A couple years of living with the fact that I essentially had a live neurological grenade under any seat that I sat down in took their toll on me. My vertigo had developed to a point that no matter how long an interval there was between attacks, be it months or years, I never really recovered like I did before. Back in the day, it was just a day or two of suffering, two weeks of weariness and discomfort and vomiting sometimes, and then I'm good. For the last six years or so, though, it's just been this constant background radiation of dizziness. Actual spinning is extremely rare, and I haven't gotten a full-blown vertigo attack since I transitioned about four years ago, but I always feel lightheaded. I always feel like I'm going to pass out at any moment. I always feel too hot. I always feel like the first morning I woke up after those horrible three and a half days of spinning. Glad I'm not spinning, but I should probably be careful walking on any hard surfaces because I could drop it any moment. 
When I'm driving and I need to look around for cars or obstacles or even just check my side view mirror, I have to lethargically pan my head in whichever direction it needs to go. <sighs> because quickly turning my head just to get a feel for my environment is the fastest way to just incapacitate me for 45 minutes or so. Nowadays, as my symptoms get better and worse with the changes in the wind, I'm stuck trying to figure out if this whole thing is just PTSD from the genuine horror of all those vertigo attacks over the first couple years, or if there's something that some drug could fix, but that none of the doctors have ever thought to try. I'll be honest, most of the time I feel like Chuck McGill. I don't even know if this thing is real or not, but it controls my whole life. It colors everything I do. I have to get my roommates to get groceries for me. Most of the time, they have to take my girlfriend to and from her work for me, at least until she gets her car working again. Hell, in the summer, like right now, when it's so boiling hot all the time, I can hardly even clean up after myself. I would feel like a useless, disgusting slob, because lately about a third of my waking hours, literally all I can do is lay down on the phone, talk to people, and look at my phone. Just sitting upright to work on my computer, or play a board game, or just drive to the convenience store to get a treat for us is totally out of the question for me. Like I said, my symptoms tend to fluctuate in severity for a bit. Well, for the past two months or so, some symptoms have been so bad that I've had to miss family birthdays, important conversations with my found family, even sex, because just sitting upright was more than I could manage. As a matter of fact, we've got a dog bed in the living room just for me, because sitting upright just isn't really in the cards for me about 80% of the time. I was in a similar state for a few months after I moved out for the first time. I had another full-blown vertigo attack, and all I was able to do for about a month was lay in bed and occasionally drive to the grocery store, where I would have to have them deliver the groceries to my car. I even wound up getting a Switch, my first console purchase in years, to help me cope with being stuck in bed all day. I'd been off of cigarettes for about three months at the time, but when I saw that even quitting them couldn't save me from my vertigo, I was so depressed that I unfortunately wound up falling back into the habit. You know, the most frustrating thing about all of this is that I really can't explain what it feels like beyond just being lightheaded, and that dramatically undersells the severity of it all. Luckily, my roommates understand that whatever this thing is, I'm not just being lazy when I say that I'll do my chores once the sun goes down, or that I need someone to get me a drink from the fridge. Y'all might remember at the end of my first video about my transition, I made a big show of actually being able to drive up to Greenville in South Carolina, and how that was a huge accomplishment for me. This is why, and that was an accomplishment that I since haven't been able to replicate. Not even close. <sighs> well, thank god I'm a YouTuber. I can't think of a single job where I want to get fired after just a day or two. At least none where I would have to leave home every day, or couldn't just tap out for an hour or two whenever I needed. God, just keeping a shirt on is a nightmare for me most of the time. I'll be driving with the AC cranked all the way up, freezing my ass off in nothing but a bra and soccer shorts, watching the other people in my car shiver just as much as I am, but not saying anything, because they all know as well as I do that the minute I turn that AC down, my little brain problems are going to get bad enough that I just have to pull over, or else turn around and get back home as fast as I can. I'm always just one bad move from another vertigo attack, or at least that's how it feels. And so I'm kind of just used to spending my entire life walking on this neurological and biological tightrope. <sighs> so that's the situation. While I've had a very hectic life these last couple months, that's the main reason that you guys don't get more frequent uploads from me. I've got some theories about this whole situation and what might be wrong with my brain, but let's save those for a little bit and talk about exactly how some of these triggers work. Okay, so I just woke up a few minutes ago. Normally, I would never start recording this early in the day because pretty much every day starts with a unique kind of vertigo. I'm not exactly lightheaded, it's more well, my head feels light. All my head movements feel snappy and responsive. 
in, in a way that isn't necessarily comfortable either. It's as if I've gone from playing a shooter game with a joystick to playing with a mouse. I'm able to move my head around a little bit quicker and I don't feel it throughout my entire body when I do, but I'm also constantly aware that if I don't force myself to slow down my movements, it's just a matter of time until one of them sets me off and kind of colors my entire day. My morning vertigo is something that, even after all this time, I still don't fully understand. I think it's just that I'm more focused on getting my day together in the morning. I tend to lock in for the first hour or so of my day, focusing on catching up on what I missed from the night before, figuring out what my goals and obstacles for the day might be, or in today's case, writing and recording, to really focus on the effects of morning vertigo before they get swapped out for the more standard symptoms. As much as I wish I could record every video in my jammies, I think I should probably go get dressed. <laughs> So, throughout the day, the heat is easily my biggest trigger. Seriously, I was considering making this entire video about climate change just so that I could then focus on how this endless stream of hottest summers in recorded history kind of serves as a major existential threat to me, more than it does even for most people. If it gets much hotter than this, I'm gonna have no choice but to move further up north and leave this land that I love so much behind. <sighs> Of course, with the first five pages of Project 2025 marking me a criminal on three different accounts, I might have to move up north soon anyways, but that's neither here nor there. As I said, a lot of my time is spent with fans or AC on full blast, and I'm just freezing my ass off, but of course, anything less than that might cause more vertigo, and that's worse than being cold. I also just need fresh air as often as possible. Even in the worst rainstorm, striving with my windows rolled up just does not happen. As somebody who passionately fetishizes my car stereo, it really sucks to have so much of the depth of the audio blown right out of the window, but that's just how it has to be for me. I'd say that my next biggest trigger is feeling like I'm stuck somewhere. This is the one that makes a lot of those real life things really difficult for me. I can't really eat at restaurants most of the time. We just have to get takeout and go park the car somewhere pretty or walk our food down to a quiet little alleyway downtown to eat it. Putting me in situations where I have to just sit at a table and wait for the food, then eat it all, then wait for the check, and if I have to just bail out to my car and lay down for half an hour, I really can't, just messes me up. I get super scared, and it makes it so difficult for me to not just hyperfixate on my symptoms. <laughs> Plus, the head movement of actually chewing on food tends to be pretty rough on me when combined with the excitement, quote unquote, of driving a car, so it's just a rough situation in general. This whole don't want to feel trapped thing also makes doctor's appointments a real nightmare. So much of it is just waiting. Same with red lights or busy drive throughs that don't have an easy escape route for my car. I don't even drive on the interstate anymore because being stuck in bumper to bumper traffic on a hot day is just about the worst possible scenario for me. It kind of plays into my claustrophobia really, which then plays back into my vertigo and the whole thing starts to spiral. Grocery shopping sucks because I just have to keep pushing and moving until I have everything I need and I can't leave until I do or else the whole trip is wasted. Same with family gatherings. I feel so awful when I finally make some time to see my biological family, only to show up, get a thousand yard stare for about 20 minutes, and then just have to saran wrap the dinner that they lovingly cooked for me and take it home. Getting my oil changed or waiting in line at the DMV or the bank or anything like that is super difficult too. I genuinely don't know what I'm gonna do when it's time to get my new license renewed, but something tells me I'm gonna be riding dirty for a few months once it expires. Pretty much any situation where I can't be back at home, laying down in my bed within 30 minutes is just not something that's compatible with me. Needless to say, I'm never going to be seeing any of my long distance friends unless they come to me first. Luckily, I've never had much interest in vacationing or seeing the world, but God, I really cannot express how much I miss camping and hiking. For a lot of my teenage years, those were the things that I lived for, and I just can't do them anymore. Next up, there's the overstimulating side of it. 
This is the trigger that makes the people around me feel the most guilty, unfortunately. A lot of talking or loud music or even just head pats that are a little bit too rough can all send me into my laying down with a thousand yard stare for 20 minutes state. Fortunately, I don't really have issues with confrontation or talking to strangers or anything like that. I can handle the serious or casual conversations when they do come up, but anytime I'm in a group of more than, say, six people, I'm just cooked. Fairs, parties, visiting friends at work, going to the flea market, Walmart. These things are pretty damn hard, if not outright impossible for me. As a matter of fact, let me read you a text I sent to my girlfriend a few weeks ago. <clears throat> Man, it felt like it was close as fuck, but I managed to get most of the stuff I needed from Walmart on my own. Although I panicked and just grabbed a random bottle of kids' bubble bath instead of my normal bath salts. But whatever, I'll take it. <sighs> Worst of all for this category, though, is that I've lost concerts. Live music was such a huge part of my life for basically my whole life. My first guitar has been signed by tons of local musicians that I adore and still listen to all the time over a decade later. When I was younger, I'd go to music festivals with my family, and there'd be a few nights when I'd hang out with the band and all the other people bold enough to do so behind the stage and just jam with them for a little bit with my guitar. Not to mention the open mic nights or all the time I'd spend busking for tips downtown when I was younger. All of that is just lost to me, except... Well, there was this one night last year that meant the world to me. One that I don't think I'm ever going to forget. My girlfriend and I had an apartment that was within walking distance of downtown, and sitting on the porch that night, we could hear music coming from a street about 12 or so blocks away. My vertigo wasn't too bad that night, so we decided to check out what was going on. Turns out that, for whatever reason, there was this great big bluegrass concert in the middle of the street with a stadium that they constructed. We snuck in from behind one of the businesses and sat on top of this little brick wall where we had an amazing view of the band, but nobody was likely to see us, and ask why we didn't have a wristband. Bluegrass is a type of music that I'm really into on the right type of day, but this wasn't really the dirty, grimy, hard-hitting kind of bluegrass that I like. Truth be told, it was probably more accurately described as safe, clean, corporate country music, but it didn't matter to me. That was the first time I'd seen a band play music live in about seven years, and being curled up in some hidden little spot wrapped up in my girlfriend's arms. It was just perfect. Never in a million years would I go out of my way to see a band like that before my vertigo, but that night, I was in heaven. See, that's just the thing, really. I've lost a lot to this disease, or syndrome, or whatever you want to call it. Truth be told, I probably just had a particularly bad heat stroke all those years ago and everything since then is brain damage, but the fact that no doctor has been able to give me a concrete diagnosis makes me feel like such an imposter sometimes. I don't want to be such a huge burden on the people I love, but a lot of the time I just am. I need help from these people to do things as simple as grocery shopping, but well, in spite of those times I've wondered why me. I still can't help but feel lucky. I've got those people in my life, people who can take care of me when I'm at my worst and enjoy my company no matter what I'm going through. People who don't just treat me like a roommate or a casual friend, but who love me and want to help me with my life and make it a little bit easier. Just yesterday, my girlfriend got me these high socks, or at least they're supposed to be. I had them rolled down because I hate high socks. But they're meant to compress my legs to stop blood from pulling up at my feet when I stand up, because she thinks that a lot of this vertigo might be bolstered by a condition called POTS, and they've been helping so far. She makes sure that I'm stocked up on my multivitamins and that I've always got something to eat, even if it's one of those days where standing up and going to the kitchen is super difficult for me. Everybody else in the house is more than willing to keep their voice down and not sit too close to me if I'm being affected by the claustrophobia side of things. They'll drag in my big fan from the bedroom to wherever I need it if I'm having a hot flash. They don't mind if I just have to take all my clothes off and lay down in the doggy bed in the middle of the living room for a bit. They do everything they can to make sure that I don't have to drive too much during the day when there's so much more traffic and heat and red lights. These people love me. 
they really, really love me. That's why I'm not afraid to call them my family. I don't hesitate even for a second in thinking of them that way. So that's why it's such a huge accomplishment for me to drive to a fast food restaurant with my girl and then to go to my parents' house to get mail and then to make small talk with a gas station clerk on the way home a couple of nights ago. That's why all my videos take so much longer than they should to make. That's why I spend so much of my life petrified with fear. But that's also why it's impossible for me to not feel like the luckiest person in the world. The love and the support that I feel from the people in my life could carry me through a thousand vertigo attacks and feeling invincible the whole time because I'm a firm believer that no matter what you're going through, if you've got food, shelter, and most of all friends, your life is going well. I love you guys. I fucking love you guys. so I'm just filming this. You're, you're good to stay in the room when we need a minute. Okay, so um, I have to film this outside because my girlfriend is sleeping and I don't want to wake her up. Um, I'm gonna give my normal patron read, but I also want to give a little bit of an update. You know how last video I said that sometimes uh, if I sit on a project for long enough, I, I there are developments in whatever subject I was talking about. That kind of happened this time, although it happened a little bit too late for any of this to make it into the main video. But directly after I quit work on the bulk of the video, all that was left to do was the outro. I spent several days trying to come up with a good one, but all I could really come up with was just shooting the footage of the fan, which is kind of lame, I'll admit. Um, but a couple days after that, I unfortunately had to pick up one of my friends from work. It was really tough, as usual. Um, but on our way home, suddenly I just started kind of feeling fine, or at least feeling like I used to feel whenever I drove. You know, not before my vertigo, but how I felt a couple months ago. Which means I was basically comfortable driving. In fact, back in the day, driving was like the thing I did to make my vertigo better. And it was only recently that it's gotten to be so incredibly unbearable that just picking up a friend from work is difficult for me. Oh wow, this is already going on for a while. Um, point is... It's been about nine road trips, maybe, some day, some at night, where I felt basically fine. There were no major incidents on the road. Obviously, I still have my vertigo. I was stuck laying on this very couch for like an hour and a half last night because I tried playing Canaan Lynch 2, which, if you are familiar with it, you'll know has a lot of camera shake and it just messed me up. Um... So yeah, things are getting a little bit better for me in terms of what all I was talking about in this video today. Again, obviously my symptoms are still there, but if I can just have those symptoms but be able to drive, I will not feel anywhere near as trapped at this place as I have been feeling. Um, <clears throat> so that's my little update. Sorry that this one took longer than... Well, no, it didn't. They all take a long time to come out these days. Um, but 
with that said, I would like to go ahead and verbally thank the patrons, especially those who are donating $10 or more monthly, such as, I'm going to be reading it on a Steam Deck this time, River Moon, Marcy, Neil Lunaticus, Chase Cares, Olive, Juniper, Agatha Sorceress, Rogue Planet, Lovely Lila, Huntacar, Catalina Acadre, Vivian Ling, Clever Bacon, I.E. Teeth, Orange Remake, Allison Dodd, Cinema Critic, Edelsis, Bree, Masina, Stephanie Starfire, Scott Edwards, Pumpkin, David Brawl, Alex, Issa, One-Eyed Wiley, Maddie Doman, Metamaniac, All Hail Eris, Ave Lunum, DJ Jax, Babylon Broken, The Narcissist Cookbook, Yarrow 12, Asiobatoon, Spooky Ina, Guybrush, M. Coy, Lake, Eva Knight, Mr. Kokoko, Gwen T, Shea Theus, Nomad Delilah Jester, Bjorb, Lily Leones, Neris, Fia, Sean Hamilton, Haunted Mystic, Charlotte, Rio, Laura M, Femboy Fishing, Atheist, Sylvan Pasco, Joannis, Arda Aurelia, Vega Nelson, Demise, Mia Maple, Nicole, George Rosenbaum, Neurofilter, The Coom Slayer, Summer Celine Garden Midnight, I'm about to sneeze. <coughs> <sighs> Big Time Jim, Darius Fazier, Almost Dead Again, Gab, David Kaiser, Erica, Cortisol, Kay, Boya, and CeeLo. Uh, I'm gonna turn my fan back on because it's too fucking hot out here. Um, <clears throat> I guess that's pretty much all I have to say, though. Um, we we kind of figured out that there's a chance my vertigo is linked to humidity because this entire time I've been driving. You know what? I'm too lightheaded to get into this right now. <laughs> Have a good day. I'm gonna go edit this and pass out. Y'all take it easy.